Greetings, Marcus Melnick here with FirearmMentor.com with another edition of an episode on my channel. Um, I am hopping mad, guys. Hopping mad. We had another uh, school shooting, another mass shooting, actually several mass shootings in the United States. I'm a firearms instructor. Do I get flack for it? Absolutely. But I tell people that I train the good guys. I train the people to respond to an active shooter. And I do this in multiple scenarios. But I'm here to talk about political advocacy. Um, I wrote a letter, uh, this is in 2018, to one of my elected officials, who shall remain nameless, because I don't want to embarrass anyone, uh, on how to address school and mass shootings. And I'm gonna, I don't read to people, but I'm gonna go over this and give you all my bullet points. And hopefully you'll agree with me. And if you don't agree with me, perfectly okay. You don't agree with me. My wife doesn't agree with me on everything. It's all good. All right, so uh, I'm going to skip over the first paragraph. And I tell them we both want to reduce violence among youth. I feel that gun control legislation is the current trend, but it is ineffective. Prior to sharing my ideas on how to curb violence... I'd like to communicate that I am more than just a constituent who is pro-gun. I have specific experience in public safety and would like to share a summary of my expertise. I hold a bachelor's and a master's degree in criminal justice, and I'm a graduate of Northwestern University School of Police Staff and Command. And professionally, I was a security staff coordinator of Children's Memorial Hospital, an advisor to the Skokie Police Department's Explorer Program, a school security consultant to the West Chester Police Department, and I worked as a crisis intervention professional in a multiple needs special education classroom where the primary diagnoses of the students were autism, fragile X syndrome, and mild mental impairment, or MMI. I realize this is my commentary. I realize that some of these terms like MMI may have evolved and changed since I was in uh, that position. I also created behavior management plans for the students who were violent. I also worked as a safety and security director in a large suburban school district. While there, I centralized security functions and implemented non-invasive security protocols, formulated a security director network with other schools, and presented prevention of school violence at an IASA conference. That's Illinois Association of School Administrators and taught violence in American schools as an adjunct professor at Roosevelt University in their education department. I'm a published author in professional journals on managing violence, and I'm a court-recognized expert witness in security-related issues. I also authored law enforcement policies and procedures involving missing juveniles, dealing with people who have mental illness, school bus accidents, all hazards plans, including school violence, student abduction, school bomb threats, school hazardous materials, civil disturbances and school security, hostage situations in schools, and intruders in the school. I've also had training in several topics, including, but not limited to, building drug and alcohol abuse prevention programs, bomb threats and explosive safety, emergency planning, nonviolent crisis intervention, threats in the workplace and investigation of workplace violence, the community's role in community policing, a violence prevention strategy, conflict resolution and peer mediation strategies, youth violence, emergency preparedness, school violence, runaway training, terrorism training, emergency operations center unified command training, FEMA training, which is a suite of incident command topics, multi-victim incident management, Homeland Security Comprehensive Assessment Model Risk and Vulnerability Assessments, multi-hazard planning for schools, building effective public and private partnerships, and counterterrorism strategies applied locally. I have instructed and taught classes in managing violent people, control and restraint, psychopathy versus evil, Youth Violence and Emergency Preparedness for Educational Institutions, Causes of Youth Violence, the Violence in American Schools, 
and all hazards planning, as well as the suite of firearms classes that I offer. I realized this was a lot to hear, but I wanted to establish myself in this letter as an expert to the person reading the letter. As I stated earlier, I am against gun control. That's not why I wrote the letter. Uh, you know, we're not, he and I are not gonna be successful in changing each other's minds about gun control. It's a multi, school violence is a multifaceted problem which requires a multifaceted solution. I gave him several tips on how to secure schools, and they are as follows. Number one, solution one, locking mechanisms for firearms. Currently, the law has changed, so I'll give you the current law. Uh, if someone under the age of 21 who belongs in your home obtains an uh, unsecured firearm, meaning it was not locked up, not rendered inoperable, then the gun owner is responsible for any damage that occurs, whether it's crime or negligence, okay? If the gun is obtained during the commission of a crime, say your home was burglarized, it wasn't locked up, the gun owner does not have any responsibility. This is a reactive stance. Better option will be that firearms need to be secured when there are non-FOID holders present. Require gun owners to have a safe, trigger lock, or other mechanism. Currently, federal law requires that all firearms sold come with a lock. Just use it. Make it a condition of a FOID card. Solution two, metal detectors in schools. Inner city schools have metal detectors. I was in a suburban school district. We had a handheld metal detector. Granted, when I was there, I never used, I mean, I played with it to see if it would work, but it was never used in a real scenario. School shootings typically occur at schools with open doors in suburban areas. Making students, adults, and visitors pass through one entrance or multiple entrances that are staffed by a security prof professional will prevent unauthorized people from going into the school. Opponents will say they don't want schools to be prisons, but on the spectrum of security, convenience is at one end and security is at the other. If this makes the child safe, I think it's reasonable. Next solution, create and enhance state level security guidance for schools. Crime prevention through environmental design is a concept, it's about 30 years old. Basically, you are routing people, you are changing people's behaviors so that they go through a certain procedure, whether it's walking through a metal detector, being greeted. You know, you can prevent a gun incident by saying, hello, hello, how are you? That you're making eye contact, you're directly challenging, although you're doing it softly or challenging the person, or how can I help you, is another way to softly investigate. So these types of guidance need to be more prevalent on the state level. Next, armed personnel in schools. All right, so this is it, guys. How many times have you seen, we should arm teachers? We should not arm teachers. Teachers have enough on their plate. If a teacher wants to carry a firearm, that's a little bit different, but I would not mandate it for teachers. What I would mandate though, is an armed presence in each school. There are tons of solutions to this. A security company, an off-duty police officer, a school resource officer, which starting to get out of schools these days. They need to be in the school, have a law enforcement presence in the school, have security that is armed. Don't want to alarm anyone? No problem. Have security that carries a concealed firearm. That's not enough. Along with that, there needs to be extensive training, not just going to the range once a year and shooting at a static target. What I mean is customer service training, what's suspicious, what are the trends in crime, 
What are the trends in school shootings? How to address people. These are the types of trainings that are needed. Next, increased training for teachers. There's at least one lockdown year a school, I'm sorry, there is one, at least one lockdown drill per year, per school, by state law. Some school districts do not have any procedures for addressing an armed intruder. Some school districts tell the teachers, use your best judgment. As an Alice instructor, I think this is way wrong. Does a school district need to adopt the Alice program? No, absolutely not. But they need to have in specific plans in each classroom telling the teacher how to respond to an emergency. More broader than a shooting emergency, a medical emergency, a weather emergency, power loss, students being sick. Those are the types of trainings, the emergency training that teachers need to have as part of their continuing education. Next, grants for programs such as Character Counts and Making Healthy Choices. Currently, the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority makes grants available to law enforcement. Guess what? I know this because I've received, set, well, the organization I've worked at received several grants from the ICJIA, Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority. One such grant, we partnered with the school and we did exactly this. We sponsored the Making Healthy Choices curriculum, provided books, it provided speakers for auditorium type events. It provided training for teachers and it culminated in a say no to drugs parade and family, uh, I'll, I'll call it a mini carnival. We had the Jesse White tumblers, food vendors, bouncy houses, DJ. It was a big party and it was fun. It made saying no to drugs fun for the kids. People don't realize that they're learning when they're having fun. All right, fine, next, not finally, but next, social work. Troubled youth graduate from schools or they get suspended or they get expelled. There should be a link to community organizations who provide free services, for example, through a township, so that 18 year olds can continue to receive continuity of mental health care. Cases should be transferred to community organizations upon leaving the school to continue to help these people. That addresses, doesn't solve, it's one step towards addressing the mental health crisis in our country, which is actually now worse because of COVID. COVID really stripped us of our social interactions in person type things, and it still has a, a lingering effect a lot of people are stressed from it. Some people may need an anti-anxiety medicine and then they can function in society, no problem. There's no issue with that. All right, a couple more. Mandatory reporting of straw purchases. Let me tell you what a straw purchase is. A straw purchase is anyone who goes into a gun store to purchase a gun for another person. Even if it's a gift, even if that other person uh, has a FOID card, okay? The actual buyer of the gun is the actual recipient of the gun. Sometimes people will go into a gun store and they'll buy, they, they don't have any criminal record, they have a FOID card, they'll purchase a gun for the gang. There's training at gun stores, I used to work at one, on how to spot these. We should make reporting of straw purchases mandatory. It is not mandatory. It's a private business. They're not going to turn someone into the police because it'll affect their business. So just like there's a mandatory report reporting requirement for those who work with children to report suspected abuse to be investigated by DCFS, there should be a mandatory reporting requirement for gun stores to report suspected straw purchases to law enforcement in real time while the customer is still there. All right, I got two more. Next one is penalties. Currently, the judicial system has too much leeway in sentencing. In a recent case, keep in mind, I wrote this in 2018, a person convicted of making a straw purchase was sentenced to four months in jail. It's way too light of a sentence. 
there should be mandatory minimum sentencing of these criminals with much longer amounts of incarceration. And I actually suggested this is where to start. Finally, we need to make judges accountable. In conjunction with the previous solution, judges need to be made accountable, not just at the voting box, but within their organization for light sentencing of offenders who use firearms or who recidivate or commit the same crime again and again. We need to have harsher penalties. All right. There's other ideas I have. They're geared towards the federal level. I would love to hear your thoughts. How do you think we can secure schools and children against violence? I'm not the end all and be all. I don't claim to be. Uh, I have an expertise in this area, but a true expert continues to learn once they've learned it all. Educate me. Leave comments down on anything you would like to hear me talk about or how you feel or how you think about what I've said. Do you have additional solutions? We can all put our brains together and we can uh, collaborate. Maybe write another letter to a different elected official. So the kicker on this is I wrote this comprehensive four-page letter. It took me about 16 minutes to share it with you. And the only response I got from my elected official was, I'll take that under advisement. What a bunch of horseshit. And I don't swear in my videos. In real life, I do. What a bunch of horseshit. I'll take it under advisement. Dude, I just made your career. I just gave you 10 solutions that you can bring up to the state legislature and uh, basically secure your career. All right, so remember, like, subscribe, share this video. I would love to hear your feedback. I would love to hear your comments. Keep it clean, keep it nice, even though I said the word horseshit. Hopefully you laughed at that. In any event, have a safe week. I'll come at you next week with another video. Thank you.